the doctor now interposed and prevented the effects of a wrath which was kindling between Jones and Thwackum, after which the former gave a loose to mirth, sang two or three amorous songs, and fell into every frantic disorder which unbridled joy is apt to inspire. But so far was he from any disposition to quarrel that he was ten times better humoured, if possible, than when he was sober. To say truth, nothing is more erroneous than the common observation that men who are ill-natured and quarrelsome when they are drunk are very worthy persons when they are sober. For drink, in reality, doth not reverse nature or create passions in men which did not exist in them before. It takes away the guard of reason, and consequently forces us to produce those symptoms which many, when sober, have art enough to conceal. It heightens and inflames our passions, generally indeed that passion which is uppermost in our mind, so that the angry temper, the amorous, the generous, the good-humoured, the avaricious, and all other dispositions of men are in their cups heightened and exposed." And yet, as no nation produces so many drunken quarrels, especially among the lower people, as England, for indeed with them to drink and to fight together are almost synonymous terms, I would not, methinks, have it thence concluded that the English are the worst-natured people alive. Perhaps the love of glory only is at the bottom of this, so that the fair conclusion seems to be that our countrymen have more of that love and more of bravery than any other plebeians, and this the rather as there is seldom anything ungenerous, unfair, or ill-natured exercised on these occasions. Nay, it is common for the combatants to express good will for each other even at the time of the conflict and as their drunken mirth generally ends in a battle, so do most of their battles end in friendship. But to return to our history. Though Jones had shown no design of giving offence, yet Mr. Bliffle was highly offended at a behaviour which was so inconsistent with the sober and prudent reserve of his own temper. He bore it, too, with the greater impatience, as it appeared to him very indecent at this season. When, as he said, the house was a house of mourning on the account of his dear mother, and if it had pleased heaven to give him some prospect of Mr. Allworthy's recovery, it would become them better to express the exultations of their hearts in thanksgiving than in drunkenness and riots, which were properer methods to increase the divine wrath than to avert it. Thwackham, who had swallowed more liquor than Jones, but without any ill effect on his brain, seconded the pious harangue of Bliffle, but Square, for reasons which the reader may probably guess, was totally silent. Wine had not so totally overpowered Jones as to prevent his recollecting Mr. Bliffle's loss the moment it was mentioned. As no person, therefore, was more ready to confess and condemn his own errors, he offered to shake Mr. Bliffle by the hand and begged his pardon, saying his excessive joy for Mr. Allworthy's recovery had driven every other thought out of his mind. Bliffle scornfully rejected his hand, and with much indignation answered it was little to be wondered at if tragical spectacles made no impression on the blind, but for his part he had the misfortune to know who his parents were, and consequently must be affected with their loss. Jones, who notwithstanding his good humour, had some mixture of the irascible in his constitution, leapt hastily from his chair, and catching hold of Bliffle's collar, cried out, "'Damn you for a rascal! "'Do you insult me with the misfortune of my birth?' "'He accompanied these words with such rough actions "'that they soon got the better of Mr. Bliffle's peaceful temper, "'and a scuffle immediately ensued, "'which might have produced mischief "'had it not been prevented by the interposition of Thwackham and the physician. "'For the philosophy of Square rendered him superior to all emotions, "'and he very calmly smoked his pipe as was his custom in all broils, unless when he apprehended some danger of having it broke in his mouth. 
The combatants, being now prevented from executing present vengeance on each other, betook themselves to the common resources of disappointed rage and vented their wrath in threats and defiance. In this kind of conflict, fortune, which in the personal attack seemed to incline to Jones, was now altogether as favourable to his enemy. A truce, nevertheless, was at length agreed on by the mediation of the neutral parties, and the whole company again sat down at the table, where Jones being prevailed on to ask pardon and Blifil to give it, peace was restored, and everything seemed in statu quo. But though the quarrel was in all appearance perfectly reconciled, the good humour which had been interrupted by it was by no means restored. All merriment was now at an end, and the subsequent discourse consisted only of grave relations of matters of fact, and of as grave observations upon them. A species of conversation in which, though there is much of dignity and instruction, there is but little entertainment. As we presume, therefore, to convey only this last to the reader, we shall pass by whatever was said, till the rest of the company, having by degrees dropped off, left only Square and the physician together, at which time the conversation was a little heightened by some comments on what had happened between the two young gentlemen, both of whom the doctor declared to be no better than scoundrels, to which appellation the philosopher, very sagaciously shaking his head, agreed.